it's one of our greatest fears. Being on a plane when something goes badly wrong. This series reveals what it's like to live through catastrophic events on board an aircraft. I just had visions of being burnt alive on this plane. Using footage that captured these terrifying moments. And hearing from those who survived them. Everyone looked tense in their seats. It felt like this could be their final moments of their lives. I looked out to see some of the engine flying off. At that point, I planned to meet my maker. These are the world's worst flights. All right, we're going to land field right here. Every year, nearly four billion passengers travel by plane. And each time we board a flight, we trust the pilots with our lives. But human error remains the leading cause of air accidents. And when mistakes are made in the cockpit, passengers could be put through a terrifying ordeal. In this episode, a breakdown in communication sees a plane crash to the ground. I remember grabbing the front of the chair and thinking, oh my gosh, we are really in trouble. Human error leads to an engine bursting into flames. Just get back down on that runway as fast as you can. And a plane heads towards the ground with no landing gear. I texted my wife, you know, kind of saying goodbye. All large passenger planes are flown by two pilots. And it's essential these pilots work together as a team. You may see things one way in life, I may see things another way, but when we come in that flight deck, we are a team and our goal is safety. But when cockpit communication breaks down, passengers' lives can be put in danger. On the 22nd of July, 2013, Mary Ann and Andy Sperry headed to Nashville Airport for a celebratory trip. My husband and I had never left our kids before, and we were excited to uh, spend the evening in um, New York City. It was to celebrate our wedding anniversary. Uh, we'd never been to New York City together. And flying is not my favorite thing. Um, it never has been. Every time I fly, I get nervous. The flight from Nashville to New York's LaGuardia Airport was carrying 144 passengers and five crew. That day in particular, I was mostly just looking forward to Marianne being able to go with me and dinner and a show. The takeoff seemed um, normal, so nothing stood out as being odd that day. At 5.40 p.m., the flight crew made contact with the air traffic control tower at LaGuardia to request clearance to land. Marianne and Andy were sitting near the front of the plane. Two other passengers further back decided to film the landing. When we started to descend, Andy looked at me and said, um, Marianne, this is kind of a strange landing. I'd made this landing many times. Gosh, it feels like we're coming in a little low. What I remember most is just seeing the lines for the tarmac. heard this terrible screeching. The plane's front landing gear had collapsed, and it was now sliding down the runway on its undercarriage. I looked at Andy and I grabbed his leg and I said, what's wrong?
airport ground crew began filming as the plane slid to a halt. The plane had slid down the runway for nearly half a mile. I was actually the very first person on the plane to get up out of my seat. On the captain's orders, the cabin crew attempted to keep the passengers seated. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not there. You need to take your seat. Please, take your seat. There was no way it was going to make it to the terminal. I, I knew we were getting off that plane um, in the middle of the runway. 40 seconds after the crash, a passenger's camera caught the confusion in the cabin. One of the tires, one of the tires blew. This engine is on the ground. <laughs> No, no. The tire looked like it just blew out. Tires don't burn. Yeah, but things changed. The plane started to fill up with smoke. I remember grabbing the front of the chair and thinking, oh my gosh, we are really in trouble. This plane is actually on fire. Any emergency vehicles on the frequency? Car 90, we need emergency services on this frequency here. Stop us trying to reach out to you guys. 70 seconds after impact, emergency services approach the scene. Move it on. Here the police. Ladies and gentlemen, we are not at the gate. But with smoke filling the cabin, Panic was beginning to take over. I said to Andy, why aren't they just getting us off the plane? At New York's LaGuardia Airport, airport staff captured the moment Southwest Flight 345 came to a halt, having nosedived onto the runway. Two and a half minutes later, passengers were trapped on a plane that was rapidly filling with smoke. One of the passengers started to open the emergency exit. He was instructed by um, one of the crew members, don't open that door. The airline stewardess, they were starting to go in the bathroom that and they were getting um, the paper towels and they're wet and they were telling us to put them over our mouths. Well, you can't leave, but if we stay here, we're gonna have a much, much bigger problem when people start passing out. And then I remember Andy saying to one of the stewardesses, you need to get these people off of this plane. It's gonna be a lot harder to get dead bodies off of this plane. I don't want it to end right here. I don't wanna be in a perfectly survivable plane crash and then wind up you know, dead in my seat because we didn't ever get off of it. Firefighters sprayed down the plane while passengers watched from inside. Eventually, the cabin crew were given the all clear to open the doors. I simply remember the relief of the first gust of fresh air kind of coming through the cabin grabbed a couple breaths of fresh air and come to the doorway and jump and slide down like you're in grade school. The emergency crews were trying to shepherd everyone, get away from the plane, keep it moving. We still had no idea 
what had happened. And nobody really on the ground crew or any could tell us. Eight people were injured in the crash. An investigation began immediately and focused on what happened in the cockpit during landing. LaGuardia's runways are less than half the length of neighboring JFK airport, so it's essential that pilots approach at the correct speed and height. One of the significant challenges of LaGuardia is they have shorter runways, and it's also water on all sides, so you have very little to no room for error. But the pilots of Southwest 345 were making a dangerously unstable approach. Ignoring safety protocols, they made changes to the plane's wing flaps at low altitude. The plane was now too high. Just three seconds from landing, the captain, who had been monitoring as the first officer flew, took action. Pilot Martin Alder is recreating the plane's final descent in a simulator. At 27 feet, to be precise, the captain decides to take control of the airplane. You have only three seconds before you will touch down at our current rate of descent. So it's really a very late stage to take control. Airport CCTV showed how, when the captain grabbed the controls, the plane nosedived onto the runway. For the 144 passengers, this human error could have been fatal. I know what happened happened and we were fortunate to be able to walk away and, and everyone on that plane was ultimately fortunate to be able to walk away. Until I actually got home and saw the kids and then realized, oh my gosh, this could have all been gone in two seconds. I think that's when it kind of hit me. Accident investigators ruled that the captain's actions had caused the crash landing, and she was fired by the airline. For pilots, landings are the most challenging aspect of flying, and the point when something is most likely to go wrong. In February 2017, pilot error led to a near miss at John Wayne Airport in California. Hollywood actor and pilot Harrison Ford landed his small plane on a taxiway rather than the runway. Number nine and hotel uniform, negative two folding short of runway two zero left. He landed on Charlie. He had narrowly missed an American Airlines jet carrying 116 passengers. But other cockpit mistakes on landing can be far more serious. Incheon Airport in Seoul, Korea. Jong Lee was about to return halfway around the world after an emotional family event. We wanted to do the first birthday party for my son with my family in Korea. His destination was his home city, San Francisco, on an overnight flight that would take 11 hours. Also on board the flight was Esther Yang, who was 15 at the time. I was coming back from a family trip in Korea. What we do in Korea? Whoa. The flight departed Incheon International Airport at 4.30 p.m. Jong was flying with his wife, her parents, and his one-year-old son. We always get the seat in the front row of economy class, which you have a lot of leg room, and there's a room for attaching your bassinet. First flying for him, he just walking around a lot. He didn't really sleep for like 11 hours, so it was really tough. As the flight approached San Francisco, 
CCTV revealed the airport operating normally on a sunny day with clear visibility. Flight Asiana 214 was aiming for runway 28 left, which juts out into the sea. Incoming planes need to touch down just meters from the sea wall at the end of the runway. Now, two miles from the airport, the pilots contacted the tower, requesting final clearance to land. Tower, China 214, your final. China 214, every San Francisco tower, which we left for land. As we were landing, I was very excited. And I remember looking out the window, so it was a nice, bright day. We're pretty close to the ground, but I didn't think anything of it because I was like, oh, we are about to land. Suddenly, like, all this engine, like, running, like, so hard. It was kind of weird that, like, you know, you actually hear the sounds. A plane spotter at the airport perimeter captured what happened next. Yeah, it does. Look at that one. Look out. There's no zone in the air. Oh, my God. Oh, it's an accident. Oh, my God. Oh, oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh Lord have mercy. Airport CCTV also captured the full extent of the crash. All of a sudden, I was just being jolted around everywhere. Bounced up and down. Everything was dropping down from the top. My uh, wife was like screaming, like we're gonna die or something. From that point, we got the second big ride after, which was like super hard. We could feel the airplane like, out of control. I felt like we we're gonna die. It was really hard to control myself, but since I had my baby in front of me, so trying to hold him tight. The plane had hit the sea wall with such force that the entire tail section broke off, throwing six people onto the runway. The plane then lifted in the air and span more than 330 degrees. After it all stopped, the first thing I remember was the smell. Now I think it was jet fuel smell, burning smell. Fire had broken out in the right-hand engine and was quickly moving towards the body of the plane. And then I remember my eyes burning. This fire is like spreading into the cabin. Inside the cockpit, pilots made contact with air traffic control. Uh, so and so, and so and so. Uh, 214 heavy, emergency speed, vehicles are responding. Emergency vehicles are responding. I just remembered looking at my siblings, making sure they were okay. As the fire spread, confusion and disorientation among the crew delayed the evacuation. 90 seconds after impact, passengers were left trapped inside the burning wreckage. We ran to the door, screamed them, like, open the door. I was asked to go back to the sea. The only thing I could thought about was get out of this airplane. 6th of July, 2013. Airport CCTV captured a scene of devastation. As flight Asiana 214 hit a sea wall at the start of the runway. One minute and 33 seconds after the plane came to a stop, two left-hand doors opened. Over 300 people had just minutes to escape before flames took hold in the cabin and less than half of the emergency slides were working. I was almost like first group who came out through the slide. I was trying to get out of it as fast as I can. People were just running away wherever. 
is almost like a war zone, you know, that you watch like from the movie. Forty-nine people were seriously injured in the crash, and three teenage girls lost their lives. An accident investigation began immediately and focused on the final moments in the cockpit. The pilot flying the plane was in training. Although experienced, he was new to the aircraft with just 33 hours flying time in the Boeing 777. Observing him were two other pilots. So one aspect of this was the fact that there was a training flight. There were three pilots on board, right? and uh, all experienced guys, and they knew what they were doing, but it was a training flight, so there was an added pressure. On approach, the trainee pilot wrongly thought the autopilot system would automatically apply power. When it didn't, the plane began to lose height and speed, and none of the three pilots took any action to correct it. And they didn't notice. They were concentrating on the training. They didn't notice the speed coming down. And when they eventually noticed, they were way below the glide path. They were far too low. The undercarriage hit the seawall at the beginning of the runway, and the tail broken off as well. The pilot's mistake had a lasting impact on the lives of those on board. We had a, like nightmares and this trauma for a while, for a long time. Uh, and even like, I couldn't really trust any public transportation anymore at the time. Or your pilot, you should land your airplane without any help. That's what you're trained for. So I was uh, pretty angry with that, you know, the pilot's fault. The crash of Asiana 214 impacted pilot training worldwide. Pilots are now trained more thoroughly in flying manually, without any automation. It's not just pilots who are responsible for passenger safety. Ground crew and technicians must also follow strict procedures to make sure planes are safe to fly. Any small mistake on the ground can lead to disaster in the air. 24th of May, 2013, Heathrow Airport. Company director John Chaplin was traveling to Oslo in Norway for a business meeting. Quite a gray day as far as I remember. Got there early because it's uh, an early flight and I plan to come back in the same evening. Psychotherapist Dr. Jean Knox was also boarding the flight. I quite often traveled abroad, so it was fairly routine. The flight to Oslo was due to take just over two hours. This was the aircraft's first flight of the day. As the crew carried out their final checks, the 75 passengers took their seats. Three F, it's literally one of the seats at the front. It's on the right-hand side. It's by the window, virtually parallel with the front of the engine. John was sitting across the aisle, overlooking the other engine. I like to sit near the window just because I like to see what's going on in case something happens. The plane taxied to the runway on schedule. I was just in my normal state for eight o'clock in the morning. Quite relaxed, slightly bored, really just waiting to get there. The first thing I was aware of that something wasn't right, as the plane gathered speed, I could see the engine cowling, uh, which obviously hadn't been fastened to together. The question that goes through your mind is, should I stand up and shout, stop the takeoff? I just didn't know what to do. There was this loud bang. I looked out just in time to see some of the cover of the engine flying off. 
As the plane left the tarmac, the covers of both engines had been torn off simultaneously. I decided to get my phone out and start filming. It just seemed an instinctive thing to do. That engine I was looking at didn't look OK. It was exposed. Several of us called to the crew and said, the engine's damaged. One of the most alarming aspects of that experience was actually to realize that I and other passengers could see something that the cabin crew and apparently the pilots didn't know about. 14 minutes into the flight, the captain announced they were returning to land at Heathrow. What I noticed as we came back was that it seemed to be taking rather a roundabout route to get back to Heathrow. I didn't understand why we couldn't turn around immediately. My thought at the time was just go in a straight line, get back down on that runway as fast as you can. When the right-hand engine cover was torn off, it punctured a fuel pipe. Aviation fuel was now pouring out over the wing and there was a colourless liquid streaming from those pipes. That was pretty scary. How long is it before this engine bursts into flames? There was a dull boom and flames were everywhere. The light in the cabin was orange for that moment. On the ground below, a member of the public recorded the sight of the engine on fire. So I'm sitting there watching an engine that is keeping us up in the air, damaged and in flames. That was terrifying. You're just thinking, will the same thing happen to the engine that I'm sitting next to? It was touch and go for all of us, really. You don't need to be an engineer to know planes don't stay in the air with no engines. The pilot was returning to Heathrow to attempt an emergency landing on a route that passed directly over London. You could see the ground, residential areas and schools and probably some hospitals and all the rest of it. You start thinking about where you're going to ditch. I knew that all the passengers on the plane were completely helpless and that we just had to sit and wait. You do go through what could happen and you wonder, what will it feel like to explode? Will you ch choke on the fumes or will you feel the heat of the flames or will you just be crushed? I was just sitting there thinking, this is probably it. As the plane approached, both runways at Heathrow were shut down and emergency services gathered on the tarmac. You were just clenched, just, you know, hoping that you, that you would get down. sense of relief and the applause as the pilot brought the plane to a stop on the runway. Within seconds, we were on the chute and uh, walking across the tarmac. John continued to film outside the plane. People were gathering 
Other people were quite emotional. I think there was someone being sick. Some people were sitting on the grass and being comforted. I can see in my face that I was still traumatized by the experience. It was terrifying. You can see people just standing there, just looking at the aircraft. The overwhelming sense was that we got through it somehow. And that for whatever reason, we had been given this other chance because it so easily could have gone a different way. Investigators spent over two years analyzing the evidence. They found that technicians servicing the plane overnight had left both engine covers open. Before takeoff, both ground crew and the pilots performed an external check of the aircraft. Crucially, neither of them spotted the open latches. One small error on the part of the technicians could have led to the death of everybody on that plane. Initially, it's, it makes you angry, of course, because it's, it's avoidable. It was a mistake. Somebody made a mistake. But the report ruled that human error alone was not to blame. The fan cowl door latches are located so low down on the engine, they're difficult for pilots and ground crew to check. So unless you actually get down, kneel down or lie on your back, you don't see that the latches are not done up. And uh, surprisingly, there is no flight deck system to show that these things are unlatched. Following the investigation, manufacturers developed a new latching system with a key that can't be removed until the doors are fully closed. Pilots always have to be ready for an emergency. In the rare event of mechanical failure, their split-second decisions will determine the fate of everyone on board. The interesting thing with pilots, it's almost as if the fear is trained out of us. And so we see an engine issue, we deal with the engine issue, we get you on the ground safely. We'll figure out the why later. But when pilots make the wrong decisions under pressure, the results can be catastrophic. This flight in Taiwan suffered a problem in one engine on takeoff. <coughs> but the pilots then mistakenly shut down not the faulty engine, but the other working engine. Forty-three people lost their lives. But human error isn't always about immediate decisions. Sometimes disastrous mistakes can play out over hours. 31st of October, 2011, New York's Newark Airport. Just before midnight, passengers boarded a lot Polish Airlines flight to Warsaw. Among them was Alexander Ryszko, who had booked his ticket days earlier on hearing some bad news. My brother got ill and he had like one week or so to live because something happened quickly. He had the cancer. Yeah, it was, I was rushing to get there. The overnight flight was due to arrive at lunchtime in Warsaw and was carrying 221 passengers and 10 crew. Also on board was boxing promoter Greg Cohen. I was in the second row of the plane on the aisle. You know, a nice comfortable seat. You know, again, it was just, just like any other flight, at least the way it started. At 12.19 a.m., the plane took off and passengers settled in for the eight and a half hour flight. I was watching movies, ate my meal. I would maybe even read a little bit of a book. But six hours into the flight, Greg noticed something unusual. The flight crew members, they kept walking back and forth into the cockpit area. I could just tell 
just by the way they looked, you know, something wasn't right. I called the flight attendant over and I asked if everything was okay and basically assured me that, you know, everything's going to be fine. And, you know, I went about my business watching my movies. Two hours later, something else grabbed Greg's attention. I looked out the window. I saw F-16s on both sides of our plane. And you see jet next to the plane. I mean, you're saying, what, well, do we have terrorists on the, on the flight? I'm a calm guy. I got nervous, and I said, what's going on here? What none of the passengers knew was that shortly after takeoff, the plane had suffered a major fault. Its landing gear would not deploy. The flight crew had been battling to correct it for the past eight hours, but without success. Now, fighter jets have been scrambled to get a closer look. Alexander began filming on his phone. And I figure after I stop filming, we die, probably the film will survive. Flight lot 16 from New York to Warsaw had suffered a serious malfunction. Its landing gear would not lower. While pilots worked out what to do next, the plane circled for 60 minutes over Warsaw's Chopin Airport. Passenger Alexander Rishko began filming. Finally, they told us that we have a problem with landing gear. I see some people praying, uh, ladies uh, kissing the cross. I got out my phone. I texted my wife, told each other how much we love one another, and, you know, kind of saying goodbye. With no landing gear, the only option for the pilot was to try to execute what is known as a belly flop landing. The 150-ton plane would touch down on its undercarriage and hope to come to a safe stop on the runway. The pilot confirmed with the tower they had no other option. At 2.30 p.m. local time, the plane approached the runway. The airport was closed, and fire crews sprayed the runway with foam. And then I put my head down and I said, all right, if it's time, it's time. What can I do? Inside the cabin, passengers braced for impact, and Alexander kept filming. I was preparing for, like, plane's gonna bump, you know. We're gonna crack in half, or we're gonna start spinning. just waiting and waiting and waiting for this impact. And the impact never came. Polish news stations were broadcasting live as the plane landed. we landed, we all kind of said, oh my God. But the relief was short-lived. So much friction had been created when the plane slid down the runway 
that it could catch fire at any moment. The flight attendants are all screaming, get off this plane now. I got to the front, I jumped. The guy behind me hit me straight in my back with his legs. He was just screaming, run away, run away. Within 90 seconds, all 221 passengers had evacuated safely, escaping without serious injury. I turned back, I said, look, my grandchildren, I survive, I'm alive. <laughs> called my wife. As soon as I heard her voice, you know, I got emotional. I was just so thankful, you know, that I was able to talk to her again. When I saw the fire trucks, that's when it really hit me. I realized then what we had been through and, you know, how lucky we were, you know, to have survived and, and cheated death. Alexander made it to his hometown, just in time to see his brother in hospital. Five days later, his brother died. That was great feeling, still seeing him alive and uh, meeting all the family. They were very scared thinking that we're gonna die. That's why those hugs were so real. as footage of the landing was shared around the world. Captain Vrona, the pilot flying, was hailed as a hero. The pilot on this plane, Captain Vrona, he's Poland's version of Sully. He just, he nailed it. He hit it out of the park. But despite his skillful belly flop landing, accident investigators ruled the pilots could have prevented it altogether. In the cockpit, they found one small switch in the wrong position. The switch was a circuit breaker that had cut power to the backup landing gear system and stopped it from lowering. Had that circuit breaker not been tripped, they would have been able to lower the undercarriage on the alternate system. That would have avoided this, this belly landing. After the incident, the airline made changes to their pilot checklists to avoid a recurrence. For the passengers involved, the incident had been life-changing. You know, when you're this close, I mean, to losing everything, to not being here, you know, to death, it makes you realize the people you love, how important they are to you. But it certainly had an impact on my life. Next time on World's Worst Flights, a twisted front wheel leads to a white knuckle landing. I started crying. The guy next to me is like, we're going to be fine. I'm like, no, we're all going to die. One man faces up to a chilling water landing in the North Pacific. And an engine blowout is just the beginning for these frightened passengers. If it breaks off and hits the tail, we're definitely going down. 